Welcome back, everyone. Uh, you're listening to the Grow Podcast by Farmers Cooperative. As always, I'm your host, Nolan Fast. Today, I've got Alan Vanalek. He is a extension educator with UNL, and we're going to talk a little bit about succession planning. So, Alan, it's, it seems like a lot of farmers out there just don't want to retire at all or don't have any plans to retire at all. Why do you think that it is that farmers don't make any plans for that? Uh, well, farmers don't want to retire because um, I think in some cases they just don't want to give up control. Um, you got to remember that uh, farmers in their 60s that should be considering retiring may have only gotten a farm to manage for the last 10 or 15 years. So they haven't had that much uh, chance to manage it themselves because mom Make and dad have always own. been around. They, they've had a longer life. So I think that there's a control issue. Uh, I think that farmers don't want to retire because uh, I think that uh, they uh, farming's fine. One one farmer told me farm farming's finally got fun. I put yeah. the GPS and the control and all that other stuff on the tractor, so I want to continue to do that for a while. The tractors are comfortable, the cabs are comfortable. I don't get jostled around like I did back in the '60s and '70s. So I think that uh, you have that too. I think that farmers don't uh, necessarily want to retire or give up control because they're. Uh, because they don't want to think about death. They don't want to think about their own mortality. Yeah. They don't want to think about the end of their career. I think farmers don't want to give up control because um, uh, some, of them, some of them financially don't feel like they can retire yet. And, and some of them don't feel like they know what, they, what else they would do. I, I don't, you know, the farmer, I've had a farmer tell me, I don't woodwork, I don't, I don't hunt, I don't fish, I don't want to go to a town and, and drink beer or, or play cards <laughs> all day or, or go to the coffee shop and drink yeah. coffee. I just don't do that. So, so I, I think that those are some of the reasons, not all, but some of the reasons why people either delay retirement or just won't retire at all. Well, and I, uh, I, I watched a little bit of another presentation you did. So you... Uh, a statistic that you shared is uh, that 54 percent of farmers don't plan to fully retire at all. Um, is there anything to, that you think that we could do or to help get more farmers to to get in that mindset? Like, is it do we talk more to the kids or do we talk straight to the farmer? Do you have any thoughts on that? Like, how we well, can help? Yeah, it's fifty-four percent in Nebraska according to the survey that I did, but it's seventy-eight percent in Iowa. Oh wow! Uh, so it's 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 way. I mean, it, it's well over half to have no intentions of ever retiring. And so I'm not sure we need to embarrass them into to thinking they have to retire. I'm not sure that's appropriate. I think as long as they can do what they want to do and they get to do it, uh, that that's fine. That we should just deal with it. But it doesn't mean a couple things. It doesn't mean that uh, their demise won't be coming. Everyone's going to die. We haven't figured out how to avoid death yet. And so I think that, that what we have to talk about here is not necessarily retirement and management transfer. We have to talk about succession planning, what happens to your stuff after you are gone, because you will be gone at some point in time, and what does your succession plan look like, and when are you going to start transferring management, because you can't just wait till the day you pass away and then have all the management just go to the next generation if that's fortunately what you get to do. Yeah. You have to think about that very carefully, how you want to arrange that. I would say that because we don't get to figure out when we are done, <laughs> yeah. you know, that sometimes that's beyond our control, we better have a plan in place anyway. Don't be afraid to make a mistake. Get a plan in place. Have it done. And then that way when the end comes, you are fine. You You're ready to go. Uh, so one point that you made uh, that I thought was really interesting, uh, it's an argument for fair versus equal. I thought that was really interesting. Uh, would you care to kind of elaborate on that and, and talk about that a little bit? So uh, how I teach or how I relate to people is I tell a kind of a background story of, of some real farmer that this happened to. So farmer comes up to me at the farm show out here in Nebraska a year or so ago, and he says, Alan, I'm 67 years old. I still want to farm. I'm not ready to retire yet. And my parents and my parents passed away this year. My dad was gone. My mom passed away back in May. And uh, this was September. And uh, I've got there's four kids in my family. I'm one of the four. But I'm the, I'm the one that's 67. I, I was on the farm with mom and dad for 50 years. And uh, none of the other kids were there. None of the other kids were on the farm with mom and dad. I was the one that was on mom and dad for 50 years. So I, I worked with them for 50 years to build the asset, to build the farm, to build the operation. And now. Mom passed away in May. We read the will in August, and the will says, the farm shall be split equally 25, 25, 25, 25. 
Probably not what he wanted to see. Well, that's probably not what he wanted to hear. Because he's pretty sure one of the other brothers and sisters are going to want their money, if not all the other three. Because they'd be in their late 60s and early 70s, too. And so it, a couple of points to that story. Number one, the one that you're referring to is fair equal and is equal fair. And I would submit that it's not. I think that the on-farm kid should get credit for the sweat equity they have out there, and they should get credit uh, in some fashion for um, what work they did with mom and dad to help build that operation. Uh, so uh, one, one rule of thumb, just a quick, easy rule of thumb, is that the kid, on-farm kid or on-farm sib, brothers or sister, should get 1% for every year they're out there. So if he was out there 50 years, maybe he gets 50%. Plus, if mom and dad wanted equal, then he Plus still gets share. 25% of the other half. So he would actually get 62.5%. I mean, that's just one way, quick way of thinking about it. Now, so is fair equal is equal fair? No, it wouldn't be, obviously. But that might be fair, giving him credit for the sweat equity he did out there to help mom and dad out. Um, now... The other side of that story is um, the golden rule applies when you're, when you're succeeding stuff to the next generation. Yeah. So mom and dad have to apply the golden rule. And the golden rule in this case is not what we hear in church, uh, not what we hear in, 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 in the good works of, of what, we, what we should do, the, the things we should follow. This golden rule is simply you had the gold makes the rule. The one oh, per, that one percent thing I said a minute ago is uh, is a kind of a guideline, but if there's not written in stone, it's not a law. No written and so, so you at the gold makes the rule. If mom and dad absolutely think the only way you can give that farm ground is to, or that farm, that, that those assets is 25, 25, 25, 25, even though there was a farming son, then I think that they owe it to the kids, all of them, to tell them those plans ahead of time. Because this that guy, this guy, this farmer, for instance, knows when he's twenty seven or thirty seven or forty seven that. He's only going to get 25%. Um, that may change his plans. In other words, if I know at 27 years old that I'm only going to get 25% of the farm ground or 25% of all the assets when, I, when my mom and dad pass, am I necessarily going to stick around there? Probably not probably, as likely. Probably not as likely, exactly. So, so I think that uh, communication is the key. I think that understanding the fair does not have to be equal is, is also a, a very appropriate way to think about this. Awesome. That's uh, that makes a lot of sense when you explain it. Yeah. And so the, and the other the other thing I, I talked about the one percent rule. The other thing is maybe you divide the pie into five pieces instead of four pieces. Uh, just to simply say well, instead of dividing it equally into five, we're going to divide it equally into four. Or excuse me, instead of dividing it by four, we're going to divide by five, and the on farm kid gets the fifth piece. So you get forty percent of the operation instead of twenty five percent. The off farm kids would get. 20% instead of 25. Still a way to recognize the sweat equity uh, in an appropriate in. way. And guess what you could do with 40%? If you needed to, you could go borrow money to, on that 40%, you know, on yeah. the, with the 40% down. You can't borrow money with 25% down, but you could with 40. That's, I mean, that's a very good point. Um, so you, you've also talked about a circle of inaction. Uh, what exactly do you mean by that? So uh, what I find is that uh, uh, people, um, especially farmers that have, need to get an estate plan put together, tend to end up in a, what I call the circle of inaction. It's, it's a vanillic term. It's not anyone else. The circle, <laughs> the circle of inaction starts at point number one, uh, at the top of a circle, and it says, I should have a plan for my estate, for my stuff. If I'm gone, what happens to it? And then step number two says, I'll go to a meeting or I'll meet with a lawyer. Or maybe you're listening to this podcast. Good for you. <laughs> All right, that's, that's, that's step number two. Step number three is you've met with the lawyer, or you've gone to a meeting, you start thinking about this, and you go, man, this is complicated, this is hard, I don't <laughs> want to think about it. Because they're bringing up a whole bunch of stuff that I just don't want to think about, and I can't deal with, I don't understand this probate and, and estates and the lawyers and, and, and LLCs and trusts, and I don't just, don't, wills and how to write all that, I just don't get it. So you just go into step number four, which is take no action at this time. And the no action step can last from three months, three weeks to three months to three years. I mean, it could be forever. How do I know about this? Because it happened to me too. I had a will that I needed to update for my own self. And I, I probably delayed it two or three years because I just didn't want to think about it. And so, and so, and because it was hard, it was hard work, it was hard mental work. And I just didn't want to pay a lawyer. Well, pay the lawyer, get it done and, and get, get, get something figured out. And so that's my circle of inaction, and we have to avoid that. We have to do what we can to keep going, keep, keep going moving. forward. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can definitely relate. I was in the service, and I know I have a will because you're in the service. They make you make a will. 
I've been out for six years. I don't think I've ever changed it. And it definitely should change. My life has changed quite a bit in that time. Yeah. So, so yeah, for young people, you need, you know, the young, young married couples, the farm couples, anybody, anybody listening to this, uh, young married couples need to, I love you, Will. I mean, if you pass away, I love you. It goes to your spouse. And if she passes away, he or she passes away, I love you. It comes back the other way. And you also have to have the other part of the will that just says, uh, if we got kids, if you have children, um, here's who's taking over kids. If we're both gone, if we both could die in a car accident or something like that. What, ha- what catastrophic thing, what happens to our, who's taking care of, her, who's raising our children. And then as you get assets, as you move towards the end of your life, you're going to have assets, you're going to have land, you're going to have this and you're going to have that, a boat, a, uh, whatever properties in different states i don't know and and now what happens to all your properties where do they go and uh what happens to that and you need a more complicated not a more complicated will but you need a more a better update to those documents so it's more than just simply i love you if you want especially if you want to have a succeeding farmer that's maybe a child take over your operation you need to have specific language in place to make that happen so there's a lot of assumptions that that people have or farmers have when it comes to like the children uh who's going to want to do what who's like what their plans are um what are some of those assumptions that generally or could turn out to be incorrect or parents uh parents are our parents generation in my generation because i'd be i'd be old enough to be your dad um we make some <laughs> several assumptions that uh, don't always turn out right. That's correct. And I put a list of those together. Uh, one assumption is uh, um, my kids get along great now. I'm sure that will continue in the future. Uh, and, but sometimes the parents are the glue that holds that family together. And so without the parents around, when the parents are gone, there's no glue. And so the Keep family the tends together. to just kind of migrate apart. Another assumption is uh, I know that my children will always want to keep the farm in the family even after I'm gone. Be it's a 100-year family farm, been recognized by Exarban Foundation and Nebraska Farm Bureau and all these places, and so we, we absolutely have to keep the farm in the family. Well, uh, not necessarily. I know of lots of situations, two or three situations, where the, f- the farm has not been kept in the family, where, where um, there's always one of the kids that go, well, mom and dad are gone. Um, I want my money. They don't, yeah. they don't necessarily want to keep that farm in the family. So if mom and dad want to keep the farm in the family, they have to make different arrangements for that to happen. Uh, another one is our business is our business only, and it does not get shared with anyone. Well, sometimes mom and dad will go to the grave without sharing their business with anyone, and that can create some uncomfortable situations for the families because they just don't know what the plans, what plans are made. So I, I challenge mom and dads not to make that assumption that we don't have to share our business with anyone. You should share your business with your children so they can see at least know what's going on. Especially if you, know, you intend them to especially, take Especially it over. some of your estate plans, yeah, especially some of your thoughts. What would I really rather have to happen here? What does my utopia look like? Parents should share that. Uh, another one is uh, kids. I'm not going to put a will or a state plan together. Kids will have to figure out how to divide. I'll be gone. I don't care what happens. Well, I can tell you that I've heard enough situations where you want to start World War III, go ahead with, go with that <laughs> assumption. Just shit, That's crazy. And then um, uh, I already talked about this one. Since I have four children, my assets have to be divided 25% to each. That's equally. That's the only fair way to do it. We've already blown that up and said that's a bad idea, that you have to first consider the fair versus equal argument and consider the, the conversations on how you could adjust that so the fair is equitable, not necessarily equal. Yeah. And, then, and then the last one, the last assumption that parents make that sometimes not correct is that dad Dads will tell their sons, son, someday this will all be yours. And unless that's, uh, unless that's put on a, a piece of paper and, and signed and, and notarized, uh, don't believe it. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not worth the paper it's written on. It, it, it's not worth the verbiage that got, got given to you. Yeah. It's baloney because it won't necessarily work out that way, especially if you, you know, something blows up and you don't get along with a brother or sister or something like that. Which, I mean, siblings fight. That's, at least in my experience, I have two brothers. So we didn't get along until very recently. Right. So like what you're talking about, where the kids get along now, they will in the, in the future. Like ours is fl- the flip of that. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. And I know of a family where, where the parents made that assumption too, and then uh, that didn't hold after they were gone. The kids did go back to not So the way along. it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So who needs – when, 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 they're, when the, the farmer is thinking about – all of this and what he needs to get together who should be a part of that team a part of those decisions this this conversation revolving around all this do you want you mean the professionals or you mean the family both 
Okay, all right, well, let's do the professionals first. Farmer is going to use uh, some combination of, I'm not saying every farmer is going to have four or five professionals involved, but they'll have at least a couple. Okay, so your professionals are going to be your lawyer. And most people are going to use a lawyer. I don't see any way around that per se. Uh, some people are going to use a insurance person or, a, or, or they're going to use a financial advisor. Uh, I think that those are very appropriate people to have as a part of that conversation. Some people are going to use... Um, their CPA, uh, and some people are going to use their ag banker. Those are typically the five that you can have involved with working on an estate plan from all, a professional standpoint. So all five of those people can help if Oh, if yeah, they, they, all have a, they all have a role. I mean, think about it. Uh, what's the CPA going to do? He's going to tell you how to keep your taxes as low as possible, right? What's the insurance person going to do? He's going to try and sell you an insurance product to make this uh, whole estate plan work. Uh, maybe a second-to-die policy on the parents so that when, when they're gone, that creates a pool of money for the on-farm kid to buy off his brothers and sisters so that the on-farm kid can keep all the land together. Um, the, uh, the, financial plan, the financial planner is going to try and not sell insurance policies. They're going to sell, sell investments, right? Let's put yeah. the money here and make it grow. So um, the and comes, then when the time comes, we've got the money growing. Uh, the banker is going to want to make sure that uh, whatever plans are put in place, they get their loan paid off, right? And uh, the lawyer, of course, is going to use some combination of wills, trusts, LLCs, uh, you know, all those kind of tools to put this all together for that farmer. And so, but here's the caution. If you go talk to each each of these people individually, your CPA versus your um, financial advisor versus your insurance agent versus your lawyer, yeah. that's a that's that's a recipe for disaster because if you don't, they don't all know what the other person's doing or what the other person's recommending, it could be a big mess. And so, what I recommend to families is if you're going to use that team of professionals, whatever that looks like for your family, put them all together in the same room. And make them all hear what each other's doing for you so that everything can be integrated, everything can be funded, everything can be put in place, all the property can be moved around, all the beneficiaries are get straightened out so that there's no uh, confusion when the, when the uh, death comes. does occur, when the time do, does come to get this done right. Okay? Now, the family, <laughs> the family is a whole different deal, right? Yeah. So um, how much do I involve the family and how much do I not involve the family? So I've already told you that I think that the decision-making from a family standpoint has to be the golden rule. You yeah. had the gold makes the rule, right? And so maybe that's just mom and dad or grandpa and grandma. That's it. They, made, they have the gold. They're going to make the rule. Now, the decision-making maybe is mom, mom and dad, grandpa and grandma, maybe plus their, natural, their, their children, their actual children. And probably, and most lawyers would recommend never spouses, never the in-laws, just the children, Okay. And, uh, and I, I, think I, I think I agree with that recommendation. Yeah. However, where, I, would just, where I, I think that we have to think this through is a little bit, in order for the family to feel like they're a family, I think that there should be one family meeting where you have most of that family together just for inputs. What, what does everybody think ought to happen to the South 80? What, what does everybody think ought to happen to the north section of grass? What does everybody think ought to happen to the antique tractor in the shed? What do you think ought to happen to Grandma's yellow pie plate? Where, what do you want to have happen to these assets that we have? Uh, who's got ideas about that? Who's, who's interested and who, who wants to be a part of this thing? And so I think a family meeting should never be, however, about decision making, but a family meeting should be about gathering input so that everybody feels like they're a part of the family. And you know but, everyone's intentions. Everybody and, wants to be a part of that, should be a part of that. And I think it should include the parents or grandparents, the spouses, the spouses and the kids, and then even grandkids that are old enough. Now, the grandkids that are old enough may or may, I mean, you have to kind of decide that. Each family has to decide that themselves. I mean, I know of 14, 15, 16 year old grandkids that are great with the, they'd be to handle a family meeting terrifically. And I know 20, 21, and 20 year old, two, two year olds, it would be terrible. They'd just yeah. be a mess. They're not maturity, mature, ready to go. They shouldn't be a part of that. But you um, have a, I think you should have a family meeting not to make any decisions, but to get input from everybody. What do you want to have happen to, to what, fill in the blank, whatever you want to have happen to the antique Model T truck that's out in the shed, those kind of things. And I think that uh, you have to be really careful about the family meeting because you're trying to generate ideas. You're trying to generate thought and you're trying to get everybody's input. Well, number one, there could be no criticism of ideas. Somebody has an idea that you don't agree with, don't criticize. Give your idea what to happen there instead. I mean, you don't have to say, that's a terrible idea. You say, well, here, here's what I think. Here's I think we ought to do this. Yeah, it may build it upon it positively if you can. And secondly, 
invariably, in almost every family that I've been around, there's always one person who wants to talk all the time. They talk all the time. And so you have to put a gag rule in place. And so when we're talking about the north section of grass, everybody can say something once. You can't talk a second time. You can't talk a third time. You can't criticize ideas. Everybody says one thing. Then when we move to the South 80, we can, everybody can talk again once. And so I think that you have to put a gag rule in place that says we have to really control the conversation so everybody has a chance, so everybody has a chance to, to give input, so we get all those ideas flushed out there, and so we make everyone feel like they're a part of the family. And the other thing I'll say about the family meeting is, is uh, you don't necessarily make the kids from uh, Chicago or, or Dallas or Phoenix come, but you put them on a, 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 a speaker phone, a speaker or, phone or, or Skype or something like that, and you, and you uh, make them a part so they can listen in. I, I just did one here recently, a month or two ago, where I had the, 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 one of the sons uh, call in from Kansas City and be a part of the conversation. And it was very helpful to have him chime in every once in a while and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, what does that mean? So we'd have that, we'd have that they would have the continued conversation to give him the detail he needed to feel comfortable with what the plan was. And that was, that's important. So do you, before this meeting, is there like, a, like an outline? Do you, do you send them out and say, hey, we're going to talk about these specific, like this no, section, I, this you section? You know, I haven't got to you? that level of detail yet, but I mean, I could. I mean, and clearly we could, we could set up an outline. Uh, it requires somebody, and somebody probably should. So it would require mom and dad, grandpa and grandma, whoever's leading the meeting yeah. to say, here's our stuff. Here's the things here's we think about, talk about, and here's the things we want to talk about. They just have to make a list of their major stuff and uh, say, is there anything else that you want to have a, as a part of this whole thing? You might, I, I shouldn't tell a story about my family, but I will quick. My father-in-law had a, a, a button collection, campaign buttons, Husker buttons, all this stuff, the yeah. buttons you wear on your, your shirts and stuff, over 12,000 of them. Holy, wow. A big, 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 big button collection. There's still quite a few around. But anybody that, for instance, the, the, the succession plan was anybody that wanted to have a, a Just particular, come and take them. Uh, hey, uh, he had a lot of them put into frames. Anybody want a frame of these buttons, they're yours. You can have them. And so um, we, 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 did a, we did a lot with that. And it was, it was very, it was, and it was very, people really felt like they were far part of this. Hey, I got part of grandpa's button collection. It was, it was really quite, it was really pretty cool. So you gave them away to, to just the family, family or just family. There's still quite a few in the house yet. Yeah. It's not all done yet. <laughs> so everybody just comes in. And yeah. Grab If you want, if you want this, want. you got him, you know? So, uh, it's funny you, you, you bring up your family. So one thing we do in all of these is I get the guests or guests to tell us about a, we call it like just a farm fail. So I am going to need you to tell us a story about something that you did that you might be a little embarrassed about or something funny that happened, you know, in or around farming. And this could be 50 years ago, 20 years ago, or yesterday. No, it was, this would have been the story I think of right away is 50 years ago, at least 50 years ago. And uh, so I had to take the tractor and had the loader on the front. And I had to go and hook up to a two-wheel wagon. I had to go get some hay out of the pile and bales, haul it out to the cattle out somewhere, wherever, at the bunk or at yeah. the pasture, and then come back and put the trailer away, put the tractor away in the shed. So, so that was I, your one task that you that had to complete? That was my task. That was my part of my chores that day. Yeah. It, it, was, it was in March or something like that. It was extremely slick on top. The ground was frozen, but the top was the top one or, one or two inches was extremely slick. It was just awful. And you had to use uh, brakes to s steer the tractor around, basically. And it was a narrow front, tricycle front tractor, 50 years ago. And I, I completed the task. I got the hay hauled. I'm returning to where I had to drop the trailer off because I had to park it back in the same place where I found it. That, that, that's where Dad would know where to find it the next yeah. day and all that. And as I'm making the big turn to go park the trailer, uh, my front end skidded. It didn't turn. My front end didn't turn anymore. It just kept skidding <laughs> straight. It was straight away, right? Yeah. And I was going too fast to hit the brakes soon enough, and I, uh, my front end of my loader knocked the hydrant uh, at a 45-degree <laughs> angle. And, of course, the ground is frozen, and a 45-degree angle hydrant on frozen ground is bro a broken hydrant. And yeah. so uh, <laughs> that, was my, that was my fail. And uh, my dad spent the next day chipping that hydrant out of frozen ground. So your ground. dad was kind enough to, to fix it for you, he should have He should have actually had me stay home from school to do that. But we had to have that hydrant. It was important yeah. to water our livestock. So you, that was, it was not an option to get that fixed, and it was not an option to leave it leaking. So it had to get done. And my dad oh, should have had that. me stay home from school to work 
work on that because I heard about that for at least a month or at least until his muscles weren't sore anymore. From chipping. <laughs> so did it make like an ice rink situation around uh, it? Would it, been ter- it would have been terrible. And not only not only an ice rink around the hydrant, but the ice would have the water and the ice would have continued right into the cattle pen too. Oh, that wouldn't have been enough. good. That, yeah. It was going to be. It was, there's no way to leave it. So, <laughs> so, what do? <clears throat> What do the growers, the farmers, what do they need to do before they go set up this estate plan? Like, is there things that they need to think about beforehand before they go, or do they just show up and say, hey, we need a succession plan, let's get it started? So the, so the bottom line is, uh, anybody listening to this and still listening, <laughs> I could save you money right here. This is, this is your most important tip okay. of, the, of, the, of the podcast, is I could save you a significant amount of money. Um, if you just go to a lawyer... And you say, hey, I need to do an estate plan. The lawyer will say, sure, let's do one. And they'll sit you down and they say, what do you own? And they'll write that down. What do you have left to pay on it? How do you own it? What's it worth? And the whole time they're writing. And the whole time the meter for that lawyer is just going just click, 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 click. And most lawyers are two to $400 an hour. Okay, so what could you have done before you go see a lawyer? Do that. You can do that. This is what I have. If, you, if somebody gets a hold of me, I can give them, I can send them the form. There are great forms online. I could send them one of them. A great form online. You, this is what I have, all my land, how I own it, how much I have left to pay on it, if any, what's it worth. And you do that for every asset you have. Tractors, combine, trucks, car, uh, household goods, everything you have. It's a great, it's a perfect detailed balance sheet of everything you got, how you own it and what you what what the deal is so you have a great balance sheet you put that together and the second thing you do is you and your significant other the spouse whoever's well could be partners whoever's the gold the people with the gold are yeah. you know the, the gold people they decide oh this is in utopia this is what, what we'd like to do with our stuff we'd like to see this go da, 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 da. they think about that maybe have even have that written down if you have those two steps done a great balance sheet of what exactly what you have and what here's what I'd love to have done with it, do with it. Then you go see a lawyer. You've saved yourself two or three hours. So hundreds, if not thousands. Hundreds, of hundreds, of, hundreds of thousands, hundreds of dollars at least. And the lawyer, if you got a good one, will make that dream happen or that thought, those wishes Basically, happen. Man. If you don't, go fire, go find a different lawyer. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I just talked to a lawyer last week that said, "You interviews lawyers. If you don't like the way they talk to you, go just find leave. a different lawyer. There's lawyers around." So um, make them fight for you. Make them make them work for you, and you make them do use the exact tools you need to have them do to make that whatever your dream happen. Well, that is uh, great advice. So, so that's obviously a great takeaway. Is there any other uh, good takeaway that somebody listening that if they get anything from this, they should remember? Is yeah, there, do you have any yeah, other points? It's pretty simple. Start yesterday. <laughs> no, people that attend my workshops, that come to listen to my seminars on retirement and all that sort of thing, and especially if we're able to uh, double up or triple up. In other words, uh, we, uh, we've been doing some really successful workshops where, we're, where I talk one meeting and then we bring in a lawyer a second meeting, we bring in a financial planner a third meeting or an insurance agent a third meeting. So they get five or six hours worth of instruction. And we, every time I get complete one of those with a class or with a group, they're going, uh, man, I wish I'd have known this 10 years ago. You got to start. You start just got to start. Don't start in that circle of an action. Just follow through. Remember, your steps are: I should have a plan. I have a family meeting, or go meet with a lawyer. Uh, options are picked, or discussed and picked. Attorney puts together the options, or my my team puts together my options. Everything's enacted, funded, signed, delivered, done. I mean, you just got to follow through, and you have to do that. How quick can you do that? You can't do that in three days. You probably won't even do it in three weeks. You may not even do it in three months, but you can sure have it done in four to six months. You can have it done in a period of time. Just you start, start now. Don't wait. Well, thank you, Alan, for coming in. Uh, we really appreciate it, but that is all the time we have. Uh, and everyone out there, we'd like to thank you for listening. Uh, Make sure you hit subscribe so that you don't miss out on any episodes. They're dropping every two weeks on Fridays. You can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. As always, I'm Nolan Fast, and everybody here at Farmers Cooperative would like to encourage you to keep growing.